Hi everyone. Today I'm going to continue on with my discussions of the movies of 1973, 50 years ago. What were movies like then? How do we look at them today? Especially from my own personal viewpoint as I saw most of these films uh, in movie theaters in 1973. So today I'm going to talk about a uh, Terrence Malick's debut film, Badlands, with Martin Sheen and Sissy Spacek. And this was a, an astonishing film in 1973. Was, this was the high point of the adventurousness of the uh, American films uh, uh, that uh, were coming out. Now, this played, Badlands played at the New York Film Festival in 1973. And it was um, also uh, Mean Streets, uh, Martin Scorsese. What, not his debut film, but this, Mean Streets was the first film that... Um, brought him big, uh, a great deal of attention, and uh, it introduced to the, to the American public in the world, world cinema uh, two very unique voices uh, in, 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 uh, in American films, uh, such that we had never seen before. Because five years before that, I don't think you could have made Badlands, uh, certainly 10 years before. It's based on a uh, a, on a real-life incident, a killing spree in the late 1950s, uh, the famous Charles Starkweather Reign of Terror in Nebraska and, and Wyoming. Uh, Charles Starkweather was only 19. His girlfriend, Carol Ann Fugit, was only 14. Fugit's family is killed. They kill about seven more people in their Reign of Terror uh, before they're caught. Uh, Malik stays uh, uses this uh, uses this framework of the story. Now, the killings of the Starkweather killings are a little bit more grisly than the ones in uh, Badlands, but the body count is is about the same. Uh, Martin Sheen plays Kit. He is a very soft-spoken, good-looking young man. He's polite, disarming. But he does, he's not going anywhere in life. We in the opening scene we see him picking up trash. He's a trash man, um, and, uh, but he has this immense self-regard. He wants to be somebody. How is he going to be somebody uh, in a celebrity culture? Holly uh, is, is the part that Sissy Spacek plays. She's 10 years younger. She seems very naive. She has a romantic outlook of, of uh, Hollywood magazines, romance magazines. Um, and, and, and the two of them really, you know, it, it is a love story <laughs> to a certain degree, but it's a very strange love story. And uh, there's a, I, I guess the, the astonishing part of, of Malik's approach is that he, he presents all these killings with a kind of deadpan, almost comic style. Uh, the characters, both Kit and Holly, seem emotionally detached from what they are doing. And Malik seems to want the audience themselves to be emotionally detached. They escape over their, the wide open spaces, the empty prairie land, uh, where humans seem diminished. The sky seems uh, huge and oppressive. Uh, they, they, travel, they, they stay off the road and they travel in stolen cars, a Cadillac driving across this empty landscape. What importance could they possibly have? Uh, in uh, in, in uh, Holly's narration, um, at one point she says, the world was a faraway planet to which I could never return as the killings pile up and the, the immensity of how lost these two characters are. And, and Holly's narration is very fairy tale-ish. Uh, it, it, uh, it's, it's almost innocent. She doesn't seem to comprehend what's going on. The fairy tale uh, aspect of it is amplified by Malik's use of Carl Orff's music, uh, a specific piece of music that he wrote for, for children. And he meant for children to play the instruments. And in fact, Malik uses Orff's original recording of that music. And I mentioned celebrity, uh, the celebrity culture. Uh, Kit uh, styles himself as, uh, as, as, as James Dean. This is the late 50s. Uh, and 
uh, and it's remarked upon by other people his resemblance uh, to James Dean, which he is very, <laughs> which he is very uh, pleased to hear. So we have this celebrity culture, uh, and we also have uh, perhaps uh, now it confronts Americans love of guns, uh, American, the violence that, that seems to be inherent in American culture. Uh, all done, what, what I re was reminded of was Samuel Beckett's plays, Waiting for Godot, God, Where is God in this Landscape, this absurd uh, situation. Uh, there's no exit for these characters. Uh, and certainly, uh, Martin Sheen and, and Sissy Spacek really make this film. It's just fantastic casting. Sheen had a, a real reputation in TV. Uh, he had been on many television shows. He always got terrific reviews. In fact, he was in Pursuit, a, a film that I covered, a TV movie that I covered last year in my films in 1972. This was the film that, that really brought him attention, his first big film. He'd been in a couple TV movies and uh, maybe one, one or two features. But this brought him the acclaim, uh, and he knew it. He knew that when he read the script, he knew this was the part. I, this is, I, got, I have to play this part. Um, Sissy Spacek was at the beginning of her career. Uh, she had been in the previous year, Prime Cut. Uh, where she played sort of a, a sex slave in a, in a kind of cattle-like pen that the, and owned by Gene Hackman. Uh, and and uh, a film that I, that I didn't cover last year, Prime Cut. So this is her second movie. That was a small role. She made quite an impression in that role. Uh, but this was the film, and of course she went on to have a, a, a terrific career in which she won an Academy Award. Um, as far as Ter Terrence Malick goes, he, he had been, he had studied philosophy, he was a Rhodes Scholar, he taught philosophy for a year at MIT, he didn't like it, didn't want to be a teacher. He, um, he went to the American Film Institute, AFI, uh, made some short, made a short film, and he, and he wrote screenplays. He actually worked on an early, uh, early treatment of um, Dirty Harry, uh, with, when it was attached to Marlon Brando. But his screenplay of previous year, another movie that I didn't uh, cover last year, was uh, Pocket Money with Paul Newman and, um, and Lee Marvin. So that was his first feature film from, from his screenplay. He did not direct that film. Um, so his films, and, and another thing he did was he translated a work by uh, Martin Heidegger that was published in 1969. So there's philosophy in this film. <laughs> now it's beyond my purview, and, but there are academic studies of Malick's films that go into his relationship to Heidegger and what Heidegger is, is uh, uh, how Heidegger uh, appears, you know, within the uh, in the framework of uh, of Ter Terence Malick's vision. Also, religion. There's books that study his religion. Now, the religion here. Is not nearly as uh, as upfront and, and as it would be later, in, and certainly in a film like Tree of Life. Um, so when it played at the New York Film Festival, uh, it it got rave reviews from Vincent Canby, New York Times, Judith Christ, another uh, newspaper critic of of, uh, of who had some influence. Roger Ebert gave it four stars. But there were detractors, and Malik has always had the same sort of uh, uh, negative uh, reaction from, from critics who find his films too elusive, too opaque, um, thin. Uh, the narratives are thin, the characters are thin, and then he tries to uh, compensate for that with a magnificent visual style. And there's no doubt that that uh, visual style is, uh, is, is very much in evidence in his first film, Badlands. It was a troubled production. Uh, he went through three, uh, three directors of photography. There were other people in the, camera, uh, in the crew, the production crew, that quit because Malik was doing, he was a first time director. They were all experienced and, and, and Malik did things, did things his own way. <laughs> so 
The film uh, was was financed uh, by you know Ter Terrence Malick himself using his uh, uh, the fees that he got for his scripts, uh, and the executive producer Edmund Edward Pressman, who uh, uh, you, he was the heir of the Pressman Toy Company, and he was using credit from that from the value of that toy company when his mother found out. Uh, uh, instead of getting angry with him, she she supported him. <laughs> uh, she she supported his efforts. She said, "I got to make this movie. This is going to be an important movie." And so they made it for less than a million dollars because of the claim at the New York Film Festival. Warner Brothers picked up the film for a million dollars. So uh, many people took deferred payments, uh, as well as uh, including Warren Oates, who who plays Holly's father in the film. And he was amazed that he actually got paid. He said this is the first time he ever took a deferment and he actually got paid. But when they released the film, or before they released it, they tested it. Uh, it got one of the worst reaction, audience reaction cards that they had ever gotten it. Um, so it didn't do much on the original release. Uh, but then six years later, perhaps because of the, the uh, success of Days of Heaven, uh, Edward Pressman, um, uh, tested it in city by city. I think they went to uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, and then bigger cities. And the film actually was able to draw an audience where he financed the, uh, the uh, publicity for the re-release. And I have to talk a little bit about Edward Pressman because uh, he was a very important independent producer of this era, and he just passed away a couple, a couple of weeks ago. He uh, was very much um, impressed, influenced by the French New Wave. He liked this idea. He wanted to finance movies that uh, American directors could could uh, could uh, uh, be free to follow their vision, and we would get movies that were adventurous and, and new and original, as as uh, as they were in the French New Wave. And, and Terrence Malick himself too was very much uh, influenced by. Uh, by the French New Wave, um, <clears throat> and uh, he would go on. Uh, I think he he had produced uh, Brian De Palma's Sisters, and he would go on to produce some more of Brian De Palma's movies. And but his main his main uh, 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 fame uh, came with his films that he produced with uh, Oliver Stone. I think he produced like eight or nine, eight maybe eight films for Stone. So he's a very important, and producers often don't get the recognition they deserve because he was very supportive of, of Terry Malick's, and like I say, there was a troubled production. He always, people would come to him and say, the, the guy doesn't know what he's doing, and Pressman always stayed on, on Malick's side. So uh, uh, next up <clears throat> will be High Plains Drifter. And this is Clint Eastwood, his second film that he directed. This is the first Western you know, that, that uh, Clint Eastwood ever directed. Uh, okay, so th thanks for everybody who uh, listened. I really do appreciate it. Comments are welcome. Take care.